Okay, so uh, I'll be fa fairly fast because I only have 15 minutes. And the way I view uh, CMIS overall is very simple. It's just enabling scientific collaboration. That's the that's our job is to make sure we foster the collaborations and solve the work on the problems that have to have to be worked on. I'm going to show a, just a couple um, uh, a results from a few a few papers, and it's just going to be a smattering, a very uh, a surface look at the science. And I picked the particular papers that I want to show you for specific reasons. And I'll point that out every time. But it almost always is because of the collaboration from uh, CMIS, NOAA folks, and Rosensteel folks that are not actually part of CMIS. And generally, the, the lead author, but not always, the lead author is also a story that I want to tell. Uh, the other thing um, that I think is really uh, special about our our relationship, which is not true of all the cooperative institutes, is we really think of this track of people in the scientist track as um, a trajectory that they can be the world's leading scientists, that they can go out and build an entire career being a SEMA scientist and be a leader in the world. And that that's I, we think that's good for NOAA. I think NOAA thinks that's good for NOAA, but it's also good for that scientist. And part of that process is it also it also allows NOAA to poach our best. That's that's the way you do, and I'm going to point that out. <laughs> but that's the way it should work. Uh, so I'm on board with that. That's the way it should work. Now sometimes the best may choose not to join the federal workforce because there are also advantages in being in that scientist track. You can spread your wings into NSF, NASA, DOE, other, other potential funding agencies. So I wanna uh, sort of underscore the, uh, what we consider to be really important about that scientist track. We want them to grow, out, grow up and be PIs and serve on international committees and, and lead the field. Uh, partners, the seem as partners, of course, the three uh, NOAA laboratories. Uh, the footprint of the Hurricane Center, of course, is relatively small. Um, fisheries uh, is uh, about a third or slightly less, maybe a quarter of the footprint of AOML. Uh, we have um, all of these uh, partners uh, for the Cooperative Institute, academic partners. Uh, with this current version of the cooperative agreement, we have added the Florida Institute of Technology. Um, research themes. We have uh, seven different uh, research themes. Uh, for I'm sure you're all aware, the the co the competition for a, a new cooperative institute is out, and of course we're we're planning on competing. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. The these seven themes have been coalesced into four themes. I think that really really makes sense. Those four themes really fit. So this is a little I felt a little sort of scattershot, but I think the new organization into four nice themes is, is really good. So we're looking forward to responding to that. Okay, so here's a few papers that I wanted to just sort of highlight. And so um, I picked this first one um, beca because of Lisa Bucci. So uh, Lisa was a graduate student and actually took a, uh, she started as a Cooperative Institute employee. Then she became a graduate student and a CMIS employee at the same time. And uh, I actually had her as a student in one of my classes. And uh, now she's become a NOAA Fed. And she's co-author of this really nice paper. And the reason I want to say this is a really nice paper is this paper uh, received the Banner Miller Award in 2017. So we're really excited about that. The other thing I want to point out is uh, Dave Nolan is a, a regular faculty member at the Rosensteel School. Uh, uh, Kieran was his student, and of course, Bob Atlas was the director of AOML at the time. So it's these kinds of really highly collaborative efforts that turn into award-winning work that, that we are uh, most excited about. Uh, so this is one example. And of course, lightning does strike twice sometimes. And uh, Jin Zhang, uh, who I'm sure you've all met, uh, he just uh, and his team here, and again, Dave Nolan and uh, NOAA employees uh, have won the 2019 Banner uh, Miller Award for the most outstanding paper in uh, hurricane research. 
Uh, we're extremely excited about this. Just mm -hmm. extremely excited about this. And you know, uh, this is just just to highlight some of the results. Um, uh, this PBL11 and PBL12. That's all. That's 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 really all uh, Jin Zhang's work. Uh, he's really worked very hard on that. And uh, he, here he's just sort of demonstrating how these different uh, PBL formulations have improved the hurricane forecast. So uh, you know, you can you can uh, most easily see it here. With this dashed line, uh, that it's it's really migrated much further down. That's the um, uh, I'm sorry. The white line is the boundary layer height. The dashed line is the uh, height of the maximum winds. So uh, nice work, really nice work. Uh, another one. Okay. So this is a a, a nature climate change paper. Uh, uh, Hazmi, you know, I, I wish I could take credit for Hazmi because he was my second graduate student since coming to the University of Miami. So he got a PhD with me, then he became a CMIS postdoc and a CMIS assist assistant scientist, and now you guys poached him uh, November 12th, yeah. I think it was. He officially became a, a NOAA Fed. Hazmi, I, you know, I just can't say enough about Hazmi. He's just a great guy, and I just love to see this trajectory. You know, I lose someone who's really good, but I, I think I have a lifelong collaborator. And again, this paper, so Hosmi, someone he works with at FSU, uh, Noah Fed here, Noah Fed here, this guy, Noah Fed here, and, and also uh, Bob participated in this study. This is a nature um, uh, climate change paper. It got a lot of, a lot of press. It got some, there, I was at a, a CPO meeting uh, Monday and Tuesday this week uh, on, on extremes and heat waves in particular. And uh, this got a lot of attention. And this is really looking at how heat waves would change in the changing climate. And so these are these clusters of uh, different, four different kinds of heat waves. So northern Great Plains, southern Great Plains, uh, Great Lakes regions in the west. And what Hosme really clearly showed is when you, when you look at how those heat waves are going to change in the changing climate, the ones that are very clearly separated are the uh, to be very uh, higher, much higher frequency of heat waves. This is um, based on uh, these uh, generalized Pareto distributions. Um, so this is looking at the tails of the distribution. This is for the Western U.S. and so this is for the 21st century, uh, the end of the 20, uh, 22nd, uh, and then this is for the uh, present climate. And so you can see that these these tails are well separated. And for the Great Lakes, it was quite a surprise that the tails are well separated. But in the southern plains and the northern plains, those those tails may not be so well separated. So that's real nice work by um, uh, Hosme. Uh, I I think I'm not allowed to give a talk anywhere on anything without mentioning the NMME project. This is something that's you know people who know me. This is very near and dear to dear to my heart. And one thing I I just always want to remind people to acknowledge, remind myself and to acknowledge Bob Atlas's contribution to this. When we were just getting started, Bob reached out to a number of people uh, in DC uh, in NOAA leadership to really say that, look, this is, a, this is something that should be pursued. He put a lot, of, a lot of his personal capital behind it, and I really appreciate that. But this is a, a, you know, a CMIS-led project. The funding comes through CMIS to, to do uh, seasonal forecasts, uh, multi-model forecasts. And one of the things that we're um, uh, really looking forward to doing uh, now that this is an official operational product as part of NOAA is to sort of expand into additional uh, products, uh, coastal inundation, heat wave forecast, and start to host some of those preliminary results at the, at, on the CMIS website and, and really engage, uh, you know, now that Hosme is a Fed, he wants to, of course, engage in the heat waves, but others want, want to engage in the coastal inundation and try to, try to really expand the product portfolio. That's really hard to do under the weather service now the you know the the website is sort of set in stone if we want to develop new products it's it's much easier to do that uh, outside of the weather service framework uh, and then of course this is just a plot um, extremely fortuitous right that uh, this is showing the 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 difference in in uh, squared correlation uh, of the NMME versus the the uh, CFS and so um, it's very fortuitous that we happen to be sitting in this region where the squared correlation goes up with the NMME product. This is for rainfall uh, with six month lead times from August initial conditions. So basically everywhere that it's, it's uh, warm colors is arguing the NMME produces a better forecast. And we've only contoured things that are 
uh, statistically significant and places which which it's blue colors are showing regions where the actual CFS actually performs better. And then of course this is input for the seasonal hurricane forecast and this is just this is a challenging problem I'm, I'm sure you can all appreciate that but this is just showing you uh, the correlation coefficient the RMS error uh, this is just a four model uh, contribution right now those are the only models that are contributing to the hurricane for the seasonal hurricane forecast that is produced by uh, CPC and you can see that the correlation coefficient uh, goes up and the root mean square error goes down uh, in, in some sense we expect that you know the multi-model is sort of well well well-known science it's going to it's going to do a better job of exploring the all possible outcomes. Okay, so this workforce development part again, we're we're really proud of a number of items here. We we have a CMS graduate student fellowship, and this is different than the next set of uh, graduate education I'm going to talk about. This graduate fellowship is this a little bit of the onerous is on the student. They need to go out and contact a, a, a federal scientist and they need to contact a Rasmus scientist and ask them to uh, lead in their PhD. And then we have a competition of among the best applicants and we pick the best applicant. And so they've already done their homework in identifying scientists that they wanna work with on a collaborative project. And it's specific, we do it that way specifically to force the Rasmus, you know, the University of Miami scientist to collaborate with the NOAA scientist. So we're using that poor student as the, <laughs> the vehicle to force that collaboration. So this is a, a program where we're proud of, we have one student in it right now. She's on the fishery side of things, but she's working in coral reefs and she's, uh, she's one of the school's top students. So she's really quite good. And we're hoping to grow that, continue to grow that. Then the other thing uh, we've developed, and we're also really excited about this and, and um, uh, PHOD in particular has three students that are just joined this program and uh, what the uh, deal with this program is, is if we corral funding for three years, that's stipend and uh, tuition, the university will cover years four and five. Uh, in year two, they're gonna have to be a TA, but, but you know, a second year graduate student is not particularly useful. But year four and five, when they are useful, that's when the university's picking them up. And so we're really excited about this program. Uh, we have um, uh, set up mechanisms by where the NOAA feds can actually participate in the selection of the candidates. So it's not some student that's thrust upon them. They pick them. They look at the, all the applicant files and they pick them and they are that student's dissertation director. So when they go out, when they you know, go out in the world, and they're promoting the science that they did as their PhD and the data sets that they developed as part of their collaboration with NOAA, people ask, well, who is your PhD advisor? It's Gustavo Gomez. It's not Ben Kurtman, because Ben Kurtman is just perfunctory, making sure all the university rules and procedures are, are taken care of. So what we do is we make the NOAA scientist the dissertation director, and me or somebody else just plays the role of the committee chair to make sure all the university's rules are obeyed. And then um, we talked about this CMIS staff career trajectory. And this is, this is um, uh, uh, really important to us, I think, in that the CMIS scientists track have, have trajectories they could be in their whole life and, be, and, and turn out to be famous scientists. And there's a number of examples that, where that's happening. But there is a tension. There is a tension that we manage on a, on a regular basis because it's just imagine you know, just imagine a young scientist that's, you know, normally getting funded to the CMIS project at 12 months and all of a sudden they go out and write a proposal to OWAC or CPO and they get three months of funding or, or four months of funding. Where's their heart at that moment in time? You know, where's their, what do they really want to work on? They want to work on that project that they got funded. So they have to learn how to manage that tension, that they still have a profound responsibility to the project that they were hired under, under CMIS. And so that's always something we have to be hyper vigilant about, and it you know comes up from time to time. But but we think the the end benefits make that uh, very much worthwhile. But we are we are cognizant of that tension, you know. And and I think some of the you know some of the other cooperative institutes, it's a lot it's a lot more muddled 
in the sense that some divisions allow it and some divisions don't, and it's very confusing. But we've we've made a you know institute wide agreement that this is what we're doing, and um, I think the scientist track is uh, is much uh, much more solid because of that. Uh, so I'm done, uh, basically. Uh, I showed you some examples. I, I really, I really cherry picked those examples. The ones that are, you know, the operational seasonal forecasts, obviously near and dear to my heart. But this, uh, the hurricane modeling, you know, two, you know, the Banner uh, Miller Award is a two-year award. So uh, a CMIS person and a NOAA person here at AOML has been involved for the last four years in both Banner Miller Awards. That's, I mean, wow. That's amazing. That's a real serious contribution. Um, and then uh, some really innovative work about heat waves. And then, um, of course, all of the facilities that we have across the street and this participation in workforce development. Uh, and I'm not talking about just CMIS employees making the jump to feds. I'm talking about also about the feds being able to participate in the graduate education. I think that's for a lot of feds, being able to be the dissertation director of some graduate student is an exciting opportunity. Um, you know, I always look to my students. One thing I tell them is, is your job is to make me famous. So, you know, I, we can argue about whether they're successful or not, but, um, but, but I think NOAA scientists should also have that opportunity to tell graduate students, your job is to go out there and publish papers and make me famous by being your, your uh, PhD advisor. And so I think it's a workforce development in, in, in both directions. And so we're really quite proud of that too. And I'll stop there and take questions, of course.